This is lossless scaling running in-game on a CPU from 2007, a quad-core CPU that came out just as dual cores were starting to become a thing, which really shows you how ahead of its time it really was. We'll try out three different GPUs today, the GTX 560, the 1050 Ti, and the GOAT of GPUs, the 1080 Ti. Don't expect anything more than that though. Trust me, I tried installing much newer GPUs, but our motherboard's limited to only PCIe 1.0, even though the CPU supports two but I guess the question becomes, can a $7 piece of software save the CPU or will it be too much for the little Core 2 quad to handle? Our choice of motherboard is the Intel DP35DP and of course it's not the best motherboard from the era, but it supports a maximum of 8GB of RAM which we've installed here with 4 6 of 800MHz at CL6. The Q6600 also overclocks pretty well. It can easily clock up to 3.6GHz with overclocking, however the board's holding us back yet again as it doesn't support overclocking. This all means that the stock cooler that we're using here should be more than enough to cool the Q6600. Stay tuned for future videos though, I might be able to find a better motherboard and we can see if we can push it to its limits. PCIe 1.0 already limits the GTX 560 which has PCIe 2.0 x16. The 1050 Ti and 1080 Ti both use PCIe 3.0 x16, so it's really about as much as we're going to get out of this platform. Quite fitting with the under support upcoming, I've chosen good old Windows 10. With the 250 56GB SATA SSD, it runs like a dream. That's unless you use Chris Titus Tech Utility and disable a bunch of bloatware and background services. On top of that, disable Windows Defender and set the display to performance. Also opt in for extended security updates while you're at it. The most modern titles I managed to run was Shadow of the Tomb Raider and GTA 5 Legacy Edition. Everything else either crashes or outright fails to launch. But that isn't surprising, the Q6600 only supports SAE3. There's no SE 4.1 or 4.2 and don't even bother with AVX or AVX2. And that's important because a huge slew of modern games in the last several years, like Unreal Engine 4 and 5, require these instructions for physics, AI and even audio processing. Meaning you're essentially locked out of newer games even if we use that 1080 Ti. But if you guys know any modern-ish games that still run on a Core 2 Quad, even with modding or compatibility hacks, let me know down in the comments below. And while you're there, you might as well like and subscribe at this point, that would be hugely appreciated. As mentioned, we'll test lossless scaling, specifically 2 and 3x frame generation with LSVG 3.1. We'll also enable FSR scaling. But first, we'll run down performance without frame generation at 720 and 1080p. First up, we'll try GTA 5 Legacy Edition at the lowest settings with no anti-aliasing and DirectX 10. At 720p, going from the 560 to 1050Ti, saw minor uplifts and lows, but a slight dip in averages as we become CPU bound. The 1080 Ti though saw 9% higher averages versus 560 and 20 FPS higher 1 and 0.1% lows, and noticeably fewer stutters. The 560 struggled to stream and load assets though, so it was pretty poor of an experience. But the CPU limit remains unchanged between all of them. At 1080p, the 1050 Ti actually stuttered more than the 560, most likely due to higher driver and API overhead, which the Q6600 has to deal with, so 1% lows were worse overall. The 1080 Ti though only gained a few frames in 1 and 0.1% lows, so it's still fully CPU bound. With losses 2x at 1080p, we're pretty much at the limit with the 560. That said, base frame rate holds at 40 to 45 FPS, but frame gen hits a wall at 60 to 85. The 1050 Ti saw a higher base frame rate than the 560, allowing frame gen to peak at 114, but it still dips to 60 FPS in busy spots. The 1080 Ti, on the other hand, was only one frame higher than the 1050 Ti, but lows still suffered, likely again due to driver and API overhead, which introduces dips even with frame gen. The main takeaway here is that consistency worsens overall. The CPU CPU just struggles to keep up, especially with maintaining the frame gen render queue. That said, at lossless 3x still at 1080p, the 560 reaches this ultimate cap, which is 100 FPS with frame gen. The 1050 Ti and 1080 Ti, on the other hand, average 38 to 42 percent higher in terms of base frame rate, but 1 and 0.1 percent lowest tank. The 1080 Ti often edges in frame gen with 170 versus 163 with the 1050 Ti, but stutters still persist. A key thing here is that higher FPS with frame gen doesn't always equal a better overall feel, and that's confirmed by the 1080 Ti result. Now we also ran GTA 5 Legacy Edition at higher settings with TXAA and DirectX 11, but we're excluding the 560 because we would have ran into VRAM bottlenecks anyway. With lossless 2x at 1080p, we saw huge drops 
on the 1080 Ti with 1.1% lows from negative 77 up to negative 92% and averages are similar overall. But again, frame gen doesn't fix pacing issues here. With Lossus 3X at 1080p, the 1050 Ti recovers somewhat. It matches the 1050 Ti in averages and 0.1% lows and actually had three times higher 1% lows in terms of base frame rate. In terms of frame gen, it's still a little lower. The 1050 Ti managed upwards of 142 with the 1080 Ti managing 138, but we're still getting diminishing returns overall. And I guess the explanation for this is that CPU temps and RAM usage are climbing, which we can see here. The 1080 Ti is a much faster GPU and it's clearly pushing the CPU harder, but we end up reaching equilibrium anyway, which means no extra performance gains overall. Next, we're trying Shadow of the Tomb Raider at the lower settings with no anti-aliasing with DX11. And for our 720p baseline, you can see the GTS 560 is clearly having a hard time here with these massive visual glitches most likely due to the end of driver support for that GPU, which happened ages ago at this point. But the 1050 Ti and 1080 Ti managed 7 to 8% higher averages with upwards of 15% higher 1% lows. And one interesting thing to point out is that CPU temps are clearly rising, but at the same time system RAM clearly is declining, as VRAM is taking the mantle here for these more powerful GPUs. And for our 1080p baseline, it does nothing to help our GTS 560. It's still artifacting just as much as 7 20p and the 1050 Ti and 1080 Ti pull ahead by 65 and 66% in averages and 35 to 39% in 1% lows. But in reality, it goes from unplayable to barely playable here as we're still dipping down to the 30s and even 20s in some cases. Now enabling Lossus 2x at 1080p, if you think the 560 couldn't get any worse, we'll take a look at this. It's now shimmering with the artifacting. But more than that, performance is extremely sluggish with frame times reaching hundreds of milliseconds. So it's pretty much unusable at this point. I guess with frame gen, you, you manage 30 FPS, but it feels nothing like actual 30 FPS. The 1050 and 1080 Ti managed a base frame rate of 30 FPS with 1% lows from 17 to 20, which means frame gen was anywhere from 89 to 91 between the two GPUs. But again, CPU heavy scenes dropped the base render rate, which means frame gen dropped as well down into the 40s. So it is in a way smoother, but it's still just as sluggish in many ways as the GTS 560. With Lossus 3X at 1080p, again, it just can't quite save that GTS 560, which is honestly lost beyond recognition at this point, with a base render rate of 12 FPS, with lows dipping down from 6 to almost 5 in some cases. Frame gen allows it to pull up to around 40 FPS, but it's just as bad. The 1050 Ti and 1080 Ti saw a base render rate still around 30 and 31, and frame gen brings it up to 119 to 123 in some cases. And lows were pretty stable, but it still remains laggy, especially in those low frame rate scenarios, where the CPU limit really starts to become prevalent. Now we're also going to try Shadow of the Tomb Raider with high settings with SMAA and DirectX 11, but again only on the 1050 and 1080 Ti. With Lossless 2x at 1080p, the 1080 Ti was a couple of frames ahead of the 1050 Ti in base averages and 0.1% lows with similar 1% lows, which means generated frames were generally ahead at 75 versus 67 on the 1050 Ti, but the base render rate this time at these much higher settings drops from 17 down to 16 and the stutters really start to become prevalent. With Lossus 3X at 1080p, the 1080 Ti had 11% higher base averages with similar lows, which means frame gen was well ahead on the 1080, with 114 versus 91 on the 1050 Ti. But again, the base render rate drops from 16 to 18 FPS in CPU bound scenarios, meaning the generated frames drop from 50 to 53, and both feel equally as bad. Now we're going to take a look at some subjective and objective latency measurements by using slow mo footage at 240 FPS, capturing my 160 Hz refresh rate monitor to see the look and feel and also the distance between frames and converting them to milliseconds. First, with the GTX 560, we move the mouse from left to right, and native obviously feels near instant, but 2x and 3x show obvious input to display lag. But of course it's best case, because this is just the intro of GTA 5 in an enclosed sort of environment. The measured latency reality was this. At native, it was about 37.5 milliseconds. With 2x frame gen, that jumped all the way up to 141.667 milliseconds, which is four times slower than native. And with 3x frame gen, it jumped to a jaw-dropping 2.0 
262.5 milliseconds, which is 85% slower versus 2x and seven times slower versus native. So it's clear this GTX 560 and Q6600 just can't keep the frame gen Q render feed going as the CPU clearly hangs back or well, the GPU just can't grow anymore with frame gen as we only went from 91 FPS at native to 96 with frame gen. But a faster GPU isn't going to help this as we'll see later. You hit CPU bottlenecks first as seen in the side by sides. Now we tested the 1050 Ti and 1080 Ti just at high settings for this comparison and looking at hand motions with frame gen is noticeably faster on the 1050 Ti versus 560. It's still not as instant as native and CPU limits clearly show. I would say the playability is smoother overall but again those CPU stores really hurt the overall experience with some severe stuttering in some cases. Comparing the latency though and you can see our native render rate was 45.833 milliseconds which is lower than low settings on the 560 but that's because we're at high settings anyway so the frame rate in general is lower. But with 2x frame gen we only saw 133.33 milliseconds which is only three times slower versus native versus what was four times slower on the 560 versus native. With 3x frame gen it's actually interesting. It's only an additional 9% over 2x at 145.83 milliseconds. If you take a closer look though you can see our generated frames of 2x is 114 to 116 which drops to 98 to 101 at 3x. And furthermore you can see our base render rate rises going from 73 at 2x to 77 which implies a bias towards the base render with CPU usage dipping at around 1% as the GPU is completely pegged which means maybe we were wrong and there actually is a benefit to a faster GPU as it gives more headroom, especially for the frame gen queue. But again, in reality, you're gonna run into CPU limitations before you even know it. Again, this is best case. You have to remember that. With the 1080 Ti, again, at those same game settings, hand motion was near native, despite clearly a stronger CPU limit. But what you feel is closer to what the base frame rate is. Frame gen is only smoothing it out here. You still quickly run out of use full frame gen before it starts eating on your base frame rate and your CPU. I would say the overall smoothness can sand down some of the stutter in some cases, but yet again, hard limits still appear pretty fast, which mirrors the side-by-side -side comparisons that we saw with the major stutters with the 1080 Ti. And in fact, with latency at native, first of all, we got 41.667 milliseconds. And then with 2X, we only saw a 60% increase, which is far better than the 1050 Ti at 66.667. And then at 3X, we saw only an additional 6% over 2X at 70.833 milliseconds. There is a caveat here, and that's our monitor is 160 Hertz. With frame generation at 3X on the 1080 Ti, we do peak anywhere from 203 to 206 FPS, which is above our monitor's refresh rate, but it's still valid because what we're measuring here is the real input to pixel time here. And considering that minimal latency, See, one would say that it's pretty decent uplift, especially with a minimal base frame rate hit. But in reality, yet again, this is best case. Like I said at the beginning, this is the start of GTA 5 in a very controlled environment here. Now, we also did Shadow of the Tomb Raider on the 560, again at lower settings like before. And of course, the hand motion tests here feel absolutely awful. There's a huge dissonance that you could clearly tell instantly. And frame time already is above 40 milliseconds at native so it wasn't exactly good to begin with. And the 2x frame gen is even worse. We saw frame times going from 50 to 130 milliseconds, which felt extremely jittery and vomit inducing in my opinion. And 3x to no surprise to anyone was far worse as well. It even added smearing and ghosting, which was far more obvious than GTA 5. So the low base frame rate combined with the lack of room for our frame gen render queue because of GPU limitations means a pretty horrible experience. Again, the 1050 Ti at high settings this time was better than the 560, but it still wasn't snappy. You still really feel the base render rate from 30 to 40 FPS, despite the 63 to 87 that was reported with the frame generation at 2X and 3X. And artifacting and ghosting are still very much present, especially at 3X, which was really distracting. The 1080 Ti was a similar story, but slightly snappier thanks to a higher base frame rate, simple hand sweep, 
loops were pretty much fine, but any fine movements really start to reveal that delay. And ghosting is still very much present in this game. But across both GTA 5 Legacy and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the takeaway is simple. The Q6600 is the bottleneck. I mean, that's not surprising. The GPUs definitely scale in averages somewhat, but for the most part, lows completely collapse the moment we hit CPU bound scenarios. All loss of scaling does is adds a bit of smoothness, and if you're on the GTX 560, it doesn't even do that. And in a vacuum, like in some of those GTA 5 intro examples, the 1080i at 3x mode was certainly surprising, but what you care about is outside that example. And before you know it, you run into hard CPU walls, and there's little you can do about that. So just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Not to mention that loss of scaling does nothing to counter the fact that just not many games these days are supported at all on this platform, thanks to the lack of instructions. But where the Q6600 and GTX 560 certainly shine is running some older games. You definitely don't need loss of scaling for these. And there's for sure even recent indie titles, which we didn't even get into today, which would run perfectly on this system too. So I urge you to go and have a look at the huge library of games out there. In the end, loss of scaling couldn't save the Core 2 Quad, for the most part at least. But it didn't need to. 2007 and beyond, this old chip still boots and just works, proving that the hardware that you already own might just have more to give. And as a side note, loss of scaling's value doesn't end here. I'd wager there's plenty of PCs from 2007 onwards that still have plenty of life in them, and that's where it makes the most sense. So if you've got an old rig collecting dust, give it a second life. Install Windows 10, if you can get extended support at least, or a light Linux distro, toss in a modest GPU, and dive back into the classics. We could have opted for Linux distros though, like Zorin OS Lite, Linux Mint XFCE, or MX Linux, which also gracefully support older GPUs. But game support is pretty hit or miss, though Linux has come quite a long way. Proton 10 and DXVK 2.7 improves compatibility for DX9 and 11 titles, and would have reduced CPU overhead for our Q6600. In future videos, we might tinker with Linux and some of these compatibility layers, which might be interesting to see just how far Linux gaming has come, especially for older hardware. So stay tuned for that. Support for lossless scaling on Linux as well is gaining traction through community ports, like LSVG-VK, supporting LSVG 3.1, and a full user interface. It still sucks that Windows 10 is ending support. It shows how little support that Microsoft has for its users and older hardware. Windows Windows 10 is the last version of Windows that will go on to have extensive support like this. Seeing all the hardware like this, running Windows 10 almost flawlessly, reminds me that there's still quite a lot left in older hardware, but that's a story for another time. Anyways guys, that's all for today. Make sure to like this video, get subscribed, hit the notification bell, and also check out this video on the screen right now.